Despite never having held a public office before his unprecedented rise to the governor's mansion in 1969, Linwood Holton is more than just the Commonwealth's first Republican governor this century. He's largely responsible for rejuvenating and recreating Virginia's current two-party system of government. Progressive and forward-thinking, Holton ushered in changes, particularly on the racial front, seemingly unfit for a Commonwealth so deeply entrenched in Southern heritage, tradition, and massive resistance. Effectively ending the Byrd Organization's 50-year political dominance in the Old Dominion, Holton helped launch a new beginning for not only the Republican Party, but also for the entire Commonwealth. Aided by a supposedly impossible coalition of liberals, conservatives, Republicans, and anti-Byrd Democrats alike, Linwood Holton, arguably the country's first New South governor, was swept into office with the slogan of, it's time for a change, thus beginning Virginia's modern political era. Linwood Holton was born in Big Stone Gap, a long way from Richmond. He was educated at Washington and Lee, and after a stint in the Navy at Harvard Law School. Then he returned to his Mountain Valley Republican roots to begin practicing law in Roanoke and forging his political career. I was determined to create an alternative to the one-party domination that we had. And the one-party domination was illustrated more clearly than any way I could do it by the fact that Bill Tuck was elected governor of Virginia the year before I came out of the Navy and off of active duty in World War II with 8% of the registered vote in Virginia. And I said, I'm going to break that up. A strong believer in two-party politics, Holton became chairman of the Republican Party of Roanoke in 1952. The young lawyer married an attractive young woman named Virginia Harrison Rogers, known as Jinx. They would have four children, Taylor, Ann, Woody, and Dwight. Holton ran for political office before he was 30. In 1955 and again in 1957, he ran aggressive campaigns in Roanoke for the House of Delegates. He was defeated both times by the incumbent Byrd Organization Democrat. Holton next became vice chairman of the Virginia GOP in the early 1960s and managed Clyde Pearson's unsuccessful campaign for governor against the Byrd Democrat, Albertus Harrison. In 1965, the Byrd organization chose Mills Godwin as its candidate for governor. His opponent was a Republican who had never held public office, Linwood Holton. Defeated in the election, but undaunted, indeed encouraged, he prepared for the governor's race in 1969. That election would change Virginia politics forever. I remember quite well the uh, uh, beginning of his campaign in, in, in 1969. Uh, we gathered there at the airport and had breakfast with Lynn, a cup of coffee and a, a, a Danish, and he made a little speech in which he said, history is beginning to be made and it'll be the greatest political campaign and change in Virginia since 1860. And, uh, uh, George Kelly of the Virginian pilot and I just sort of looked at each other and laughed because we didn't expect him to win, of course. I thought it was time for a change. All of us, you know, myself included, uh, uh, had voted Republican since I ran for office in 1952. But in general, we supported uh, Democratic candidates uh, at other times, and that was because Republicans really didn't have any strong candidates. And Cynthia Newman was one of the key leaders of this effort to get the Republican Party really organized, to get the uh, chairman set up, to get their campaign workers organized. Uh, it was by far the most ambitious campaign that the Republican Party had ever run in Virginia, and was a, really ahead of what the Democratic Party uh, was doing at that time. In, by 1969, 
I just had an inkling all along at that time that he was going to win. Now, don't ask me why. It was just a hunch. Well, for one thing, I knew the Democrats were pretty badly split. And, and that was really what happened. I mean, the, 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 the Democrats tore themselves apart. And meanwhile, Holton, among other things, had been wooing the African-American vote. And it's another thing we ought to remember about 1965, and that was, that was the year the Voting Rights Act was passed, which relieved, removed the last barrier to African-Americans voting in Virginia elections, which God knows they tried to keep them from doing for generations. So Holton had a lot of support among black Virginians by 1969. I don't think that blacks had seen the Republican Party as an alternative, but they began to see that perhaps Lynn Holton could be an alternative. And what was there to lose? Uh, so blacks, approximately 37% of the black vote in that election went to Lynn Holton. Before that time, you could defeat a candidate by saying he's supported by the blacks. After that point, after supporting Holton and helping him win, the black vote became, or well, the African-American vote became a legitimate prize that has been sought after ever since. Campaigning was a totally new thing to me. Uh, I had seen other uh, candidates' wives sitting at the banquet table, smiling adoringly up at their husbands while they made speeches. And I thought, well, that doesn't look so bad. And I thought I would be going around the state doing that with him. And then when Cynthia showed up and said, Oh, no, I've got this whole statewide program for all the candidates' wives, separate for the men, and we're going to be running around in this beflowered, polka-dotted Dodge motorhome. I told her she was crazy. <laughs> so we had a, a wonderful tape on the bus, and one of the problems we always had to encounter was whether we could play the tape within the the zone of the city or county, and we tried to keep check on that very well. But it was a nice swinging song about Linwood Houghton and the kids in the gas stations would be dancing as they heard us coming down the road. <laughs> Lynn Houghton has what it takes to lead Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as the campaign went and the, the nature of the politics, uh, between Linwood Houghton and myself, there was no need for dirty campaigning. Uh, it just wasn't. In, in either one of us method of doing the job. I tell people that uh, I achieved something that was very hard to achieve. I had Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, Spiro T. Agnew, the AFL-CIO, and the Black Caucus against me. And <laughs> that, that, if you can put together that coalition, you're pretty good. I think that Bill Battle was the most difficult of the three Democratic candidates for Lynn to run against. If he'd run at either end, he uh, could have picked up support more easily. Basically, it comes down to the fact that I think people voted for an attractive new face. They wanted a change in government. They wanted a two-party system in Virginia. But Holton was looking back at the year in the campaign and he said, the year 1969 will be known for three amazing things. When the man went on the moon in July of 1969, I notched that as one accomplishment. When the Mets won the pennant in October of 1969, I knew I was going to be home free. And then uh, in November came the election. So it was the moon, the Mets, and me. <laughs> I ran against my friend Bill Battle for governor of Virginia. Yes, you did. And I was in this great big room celebrating the victory, the first time a Republican had ever won a statewide race, and all these people were in there just ecstatic. Well, it certainly wasn't planned. Um, uh, we were down at our headquarters, and obviously things had not gone well. And my wife and I, with some of the uh, newspaper fellows had become quite close, were walking back up to the uh, hotel, and I just decided, well, gee whiz, it's a great night for them. Let's go up and say, well done. It was spur of the moment. 
and who opened the door over there and walked in with his wife but my opponent to congratulate me personally for beating him. People were shouting and screaming, balloons were everywhere, and when they, people saw Bill and Barry Battle, the losing candidate, come into the room, the uh, noise just increased uh, many decibels more, uh, and they a pathway plotted uh, in the crowd and they came forward and uh, the hair on the back of your neck just went up. Uh, it was uh, a moment that you could, couldn't imagine. I never had expected the reaction it got uh, and has gotten, uh, still gets, you know, it got there. Uh, they, were, they were all overwhelmed. Well, I was very humbled by that and I was very proud of Bill Battle and very proud of being a Virginian. I thought that was just the most magnanimous gesture I had ever seen. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Virginia, and the Constitution of the State of Virginia, and that I will faithfully and impartially, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform, discharge and perform Linwood Holton became Virginia's first Republican governor since Reconstruction. Reflecting his campaign slogan, it's time for a change, he set out immediately to break with the past, beginning with his appointments. So help me God. So help me God. I think there was a significant change in politics in the state uh, with the Holton administration. The, um, the demise of the Barrett organization, of course, was uh, uh, was one very important change. Um, again, the kinds of people that the governor appointed to boards, to commissions, to state agencies, Virginians began to feel that uh, more and more people had a had a stake in state government than it had been the case previously. Two days after that election, Lynn Holton called and said, Bill, I want you to go to Richmond with me as my special assistant. And the answer was yes. I became the first African American to serve on the executive staff of a Virginia governor. My job was to see to it that those who had been left out those who were uh, locked out, those who were not a part of, now would become a part of state government and also to work with the private sector. The governor essentially was, uh, uh, was party blind in that uh, it didn't matter whether, what party affiliation the person had. And you have to remember, of course, that the Republican Party had been out of power since Reconstruction, or since shortly after Reconstruction. And I think an awful lot of Republicans were unhappy that um, the rascals were not thrown out and, and, and appointments instead given to them. And it was the one thing that got him into trouble with his own party, and that was at the first meeting that he met with his fellow Republicans, he called them my fellow Republicans, and he said, that's the last time you're gonna have me say that because I'm now the governor of all Virginians. In 1970, Holton opposed Harry Byrd Jr.'s run for the U.S. Senate as an independent, laying the groundwork for future Republican candidates in all statewide elections. While that decision galvanized the Republicans at the onset of Holton's term, a new issue, federally mandated busing to integrate public schools would bring him national attention and acclaim. Listen, Richmond, Chesterfield, and Henrico was a, a simmering hotbed over busing at that time. Uh, there were bumper stickers, the little red schoolhouses on the backs of virtually every car that you would see. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a very, very, very uh, charged political issue. And uh, there were lots of people that thought the governor uh, ought to have the state 
uh, taking the feds to court to, to try to stop the busing process. And any time you get into those kind of issues, it is extremely divisive. Then the Supreme Court busing order came down. And they didn't give the schools much time to implement it. There was a lot of fear uh, of what the consequences could be. So we, like the other families, had to decide during the summer what to do with our children. He said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, what we need, Governor, is leadership. Jinx and I said our kids will go where the busing plan would have had them go. And um, I think it was the greatest opportunity that a governor could have to carry out an inaugural address such as I had given that the age of defiance is past and that it's time for Virginia to be a, an example as a model of race relations. Over the summer they thought about it and finally Taylor was the first to announce her decision and she said, well, I've thought about it uh, and I am going to go to John F. Kennedy High School, the one that we would be assigned to, but I want to be sure to get a switchblade knife for my birthday. <laughs> they, we, they took the whole thing with a sense of humor, the children did. And I think that lightened the burden for us, the fact that they did take it with a sense of humor. When I had taken the children into the school to begin with, uh, I didn't know much about what I would find at Mosby Middle School. And after a while, I realized I wasn't going to see a white person. So I asked a black lady, and she very graciously and kindly said, yeah, take them there in the auditorium. That's where you go. So I did that. And when I got back to the car, there was a Los Angeles Times reporter. A lot of people were standing around, lots, standing around in the schoolyard. And he said, you see those two families that are going in now? He said, they've been out here with me kind of watching and trying to decide whether to go in. And he said, I told them who you are and that you'd felt it was safe because you left your children in there. And you see, there they go up the stairs. They're going in there now with their children. Uh, that made me f feel good that they had done that. When the picture of Governor Holton taking his daughter Taylor appeared in papers all over the nation, the message went, that went with that all unsaid was uh, a message not only to Virginia, but to the South and to the nation that Virginia is going to support education and support integrated education in the future. I had in the back of my mind as when I saw the picture of my oldest child, Taylor, who went with me to the high school that day, and I knew that the other two had gone with Jinx to the other school, I saw in my mind the pictures of George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door defying the federal government. I saw in my mind the pictures of Ross Barnett defying the federal government in the doors of the schools' houses of Mississippi. I saw in my mind Orville Faubus defying the United States government in the schools of Little Rock. And I was proud for Virginia to say, if that's what the law is, we'll comply with it. It gave me hope uh, that Virginia and Virginians could be okay good good people. Uh, I think the most amazing thing that happened to me during the Holton administration was a football game between John F. Kennedy, which Governor Holton's daughter was on the cheering squad. Uh, they were playing John Marshall and it was a big game. It was at Hovey Field. And Governor Holton and his whole family came to the football game. And they were sitting up in the stands like any other family. And he was rooting for John, uh, rooting for uh, Kennedy. The people were just amazed that the governor of Virginia would come over to Hoover Field at Virginia Union to see John Marshall and John F. Kennedy play football. This was a first. Holton achieved two other significant firsts for the Commonwealth. He opened up state government to all Virginians and then he streamlined its operations by establishing the state's first ever cabinet. I remember the first agency that I targeted was the Virginia State Police Force. And I targeted that entity because in my estimation, it was the most highly visible 
heart of state government. So now we're starting with 1,300 state troopers and not one black. I sat with the agency head. Uh, the agency head had said, we cannot find qualified blacks for uh, the position of state trooper. I went back and reported to, to Governor Holton that this was the attitude of the Virginia State Police. And I said, Governor, I know qualified people are out there. And the governor said to me, Bill, find them. In terms of state government, over a four-year period, 18% uh, of the state government workforce became African American. We up the number of African Americans working in state government by approximately 25% during that four-year period. We were very pleased with that. One of the themes that Governor Holton uh, sounded in his campaigning was that Virginia needed a more efficient government, that it needed to be better organized. At the time, it had about 150 different agencies, departments, boards, and so forth who reported directly to the governor of Virginia. The agency heads like that system because governors come and go but uh, legislators tend to stay around longer. So if they could build good relations with the legislature, they liked that. And then they would uh, really uh, be able to control their uh, destiny and set their own policy, so to speak. The governor needed to get the agency head's support for any proposal to create a cabinet. That was a remarkable uh, achievement of the governor. The majority leader in the House of Delegates opposed that bill and did his best to kill it. But we beat him. It was a close vote. It required 51 votes constitutionally to pass it. We had 51 votes. In the Senate, um, we had uh, strong support from Senator Omer Hurst. We had support from Senator Willie. Um, <clears throat> bill Hopkins, who was the majority leader, opposed it. Uh, and he fought hard to kill it. And we won that one only late the last night of the uh, session of the General Assembly. And that one was so close that we, we won it when an amendment that would have killed the bill because it would have required going back to the House. The amendment was defeated by a tie vote. And we only got to that tie vote because Doug Wilder reversed his vote and asked for a reconsideration when the bill, when the amendment had been adopted and reversed his vote and helped kill the amendment so that we got a favorable vote in the end. Virginia's governors serve a four-year term and for Holton, this was his only time in public office. He stayed involved with Virginia politics and in 1978, he threw his hat into the ring for the last time. He was defeated in the primary for the U.S. Senate nomination, a seat later won by John Warner. Leaving campaigns behind, Holton went on to serve the American Council of Life Insurance, chaired the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, and was president of the Virginia Center of Innovative Technology. He and Jinks now live in McLean, Virginia, where he serves as director of a law firm. Linwood Holton continues to hold strong opinions about Virginia politics, especially the direction of the Republican Party. My hope is that the grand old party I worked so long and hard to make a winner will thereby become a permanent component of a vibrant two-party competition which will best guarantee the highest standard of living in the best possible environment for not just some, but all Virginians. Since Holton's term, four more Republicans have served in the Commonwealth's highest office through the end of the century. In fact, the Republican Party has gone from a distant second in Virginia politics to become the dominant party during the 1980s and 1990s. In addition to dramatically furthering his own party, Holton made great strides toward racial equality. Linwood Holton will be remembered for resurrecting the two-party system in Virginia, but more dramatically, he'll be remembered for his personal leadership on race relations, which brought Virginia into a new era and heralded the beginning of the New South. Somehow, 
Southerners forgot about what Abraham Lincoln did. And I think he made that issue come back in a positive way here in Virginia. The, the singular thing that I would attribute to Linwood Holton in terms of, the, of impact on the quality of life and government in Virginia is to open it up to all folks. Rich, poor, black, white, male, female. And uh, to me, that is a tremendous legacy because uh, it really gives people the feeling that they do have a voice in their government and all views will be considered. That he was the first governor in the South to step forth and say, enough is enough. We want to make Virginia a model for race relations in America and not a model of massive resistance. Governor Holton's leadership on the integration issue at the critical time in Virginia will be right near the top of his achievements. It elevated uh, race to a subject that we could talk about in a way that was positive.